Well, it's good to see you. I've been preaching from a, the pulpit with an empty pew. I never in my life thought I could ever do that. Uh, but somehow or another, the grace of God uh, was able, I was able to do that. So we welcome you today to the 930 uh, Sunday service uh, from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church of Birmingham, Alabama. We picked up a whole lot of people uh, during this crisis uh, across, across the world. And uh, it's a tribute to John Dyer's faithfulness to the internet ministry of this church. And I'm so thankful for that ministry. Uh, as Al mentioned, we did have the funeral of Frank Holt uh, Tuesday, uh, family only. That was an experience, too, uh, of uh, a funeral of a guy who, if we'd have been able to hold it in a church, we'd have packed the church out. Uh, our church probably wouldn't have held it. That's how well known Frank Holt was in the community of Birmingham and a greater area. Uh, what a great family. And I, I would encourage you to pray for Mary Beth, Mike, and Chuck as members of that family as they uh, adjust uh, with uh, life without Frank. It was a good funeral as funerals go. And uh, a good time to be with that family. I haven't been with that family in a pretty good while. And so it was good to be with them and, uh, and to talk with them individually and see all the things that have been going on in their life for the last 20, 25 years uh, that uh, Mike and Chuck were kids when they were here, and now they're grown men and, and doing well in their life. Well, I know we've all struggled with this uh, COVID-19 virus that we've had, and I tried to develop uh, a ministry to you over uh, March, April, and May uh, through the Internet on Wednesdays and Sundays to try to keep you afloat uh, on dealing with the, the crisis of this in our, our community. Uh, we will continue our Wednesday study on video. We will not meet an assembly until sometime in June, probably the middle of June, uh, I, when I when I we reassemble, I want to reassemble as we left the Wednesday. I want to go back to um, dinners, uh, lunching, and I'm not quite sure because Birmingham is still struggling uh, with uh, the numbers. Of course, they're they're um, they're testing like crazy, which is a good thing in uh, in different sections of our city. And so we'll, we'll have to, we'll just play that by ear and see where it goes. But I'm going to stay on my Wednesday daytime schedule along with my Sunday. Uh, we're going to start a new series of studies on Sunday. And uh, it, the life of Elijah, it's taken, the life of Elijah is really an interesting life. It starts in 1 Kings 17 and goes through 2 Kings 2.18. So it's... 1 Kings 17, 1, we'll go through the second chapter of 2 Kings into verse 18. Uh, Elijah, we know nothing about his background. He's a prophet that just shows up. Only thing we know about Elijah from the Old Testament is what you read in the 17th chapter, verse 1, which we're going to read today. This is all we know of this guy. And, and yet, we seem to know a lot about him. In fact, I was, I was, I was going to ask Ed uh, about that song. Remember, there was a song called Elijah? Elijah. Remember that? I think it was a pop song, though, wasn't it? Now, I don't remember anymore except that one line of that song, but I was going to ask Ed about that song, uh, that I might go listen to it again, because I can't remember anything other than Elijah. That's the only thing I remember about. But here he is in the 17th chapter of 1 Kings 17, 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of, of, uh, the, uh, of Gilead, the, the word settler is really interesting. Uh, and that's about all we know. 
what we do know by be call, be, being called a settler of Gilead, now we're on the, uh, we're on the east side of the Jordan River and Manasseh, uh, the tribe of Manasseh. We know that. Uh, but settlers, he's called, he's called the, he's part of the settlers of Gilead. Uh, and what we do know about him is that he would have been a mountain man. He'd have been a mountain man. I mean, a true mountain man, too. Not just somebody who lives in a mountain. You know, today we have a lot of people who live on farms that aren't farmers. <laughs> well, he lived in the mountains, but it wasn't because that was a resort kind of an idea. He, he was really a mountain man. And it's interesting, and we know, actually, we know more about him in the New Testament than we do the Old Testament, other than his true ministry he had uh, with uh, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. But uh, when John the Baptist comes out of, out of the prophetic teachings of Malachi, the fourth chapter of Malachi, third and the fourth chapter of Malachi, it's, prof it's prophesied by Malachi, the last book of the Old Covenant, that when Christ would come into the world, a prophet would show up and declare his coming and announce his arrival. And, and he, he would be like Elijah. He would be like Elijah. And, and John the Baptist came. We know him as John the Baptist, but he came like Elijah. If you know anything about John the Baptist, he came out of the desert. And, uh, you know, he dressed as a, a desert person. He wasn't a city slicker dresser. And he, he never did buy into the city slicker. Uh, that's Elijah. Elijah was a mountain guy. Uh, he was a true mountain guy, and when he went into the city, he never became a city slicker, not in his manner nor his dress. He remained a mountain man. He was rough and a tough guy, and it's important for us to know that about him. He was a settler of Gilead in the mountain regions, and that, that, that we know about him as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, and when he when he comes to speak, now what is important, when he comes to speak, he just shows up and speaks to the king. <laughs> I don't know how you just do that. You, you got to be bold. I suppose you have to dress different. I don't know. But he just shows up unannounced and has a conference meeting with uh, King Ahab. And how he introduces himself to King Ahab is really important because he laid the gauntlet down on him. Now, what he did is he announced himself as a national prophet under the authority of God, and he declared a prophetic oath as the prophet to a nation. There was an oath, and he declared to the king that God has sent me with a message to you, and you better have ears to hear, so to speak. And he does it with what's called the prophetic oath. Now, here it is. And here's what he stands. He stands boldly as an old mountain guy. You know, uh, Rick, who did we na name Jeremiah after? Jeremiah, Jeremiah Johnson. <laughs> you remember the mountain guy? That was one of the, our family's great. We love that guy. And we, when Jeremiah came along, we named him after, everybody thinks we were spiritual and named him after the great prophet. But we were actually carnal. <laughs> Not really. We named, him, we named him after Jeremiah Johnson. If you want to picture somebody in your mind that would be like Elijah, that would be the guy. That would be the guy. And, it, and here's the oath in 17.1. Here's the oath, and here's what he speaks in front of the king. As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives. Isn't that interesting? Before whom I stand. Actually, that word means serve. I stand in service. As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before 
before whom I stand before you in service. Surely, that goes with part of the oath, not with the second part. There should be a, peri there should be a comma. If you're going to have a comma, that has to be after surely as well as before. In the Hebrew, there's one before and one after. It should read, as the Lord, the God of Israel, and for whom, before whom I stand surely, before whom I stand surely, absolutely, a prophet come from God to announce something to you personally and to the nation. So it should be as a, and actually, um, I believe if you have a King James Bible, if I remember right, there's a comma before surely and after surely to make sure you understand that goes with the first part of this, not the second part. You got two? Got one after surely? Got one before or after? One before. Well, the word surely actually goes with it. As the Lord, the God of Israel, is before whom I stand surely, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Now, that's a... Whew. Could you imagine somebody going before the President of the United States? Live TV. This is an old farmer. I mean, just a farmer rode his, rode his mule into town, got off from it, and said, I need to talk with you, and they're on live television. Interrupts a conference, says, I, I have a word with you. I need to have a word with you. And they're like, well, what do you say? And he says this. And then the people go through three and a half years. From that day, Ahab, King Ahab has a choice. Come back to God or go through three and a half years where I'm going to shut down your entire economy for three and a half years. Look, we, we've been down three months, and look where, what kind of shape we're in. Look at our unemployment, the food lines. Look at the shape we're in. Three and a half years. James, the fifth chapter, tells you that. First Kings 17 doesn't. Three and a half years. I mean, people were dying. You know, he shows up at a widow's house. You remember that? She's eating her last meal. We heard her son are going to eat the meal and die. We don't have another meal. And he says, you do it today, honey. <laughs> you do it today. Give me that last portion and you'll eat the rest of your life like a king, like a queen. Elijah was an interesting guy. Elijah's ministry as a national prophet was to the north kingdom, the ten tribes, as we call them, and expanded from King Ahab to King Jorab, Joram. That was the life. Now, the majority of his entire ministry, ministry is under King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. That's why it's very famous. King Ahab was the eighth king under, uh, f counting from uh, Jeroboam, from Jeroboam, which was the dividing of the kingdom. Now, there, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, after David's death, they split the nations into the north and the south. They split the nations into north and south. There was a north kingdom and a southern kingdom. And they were two states, not, not one, two. And uh, the north kingdom set their capital up in Samaria. In Samaria. And so King Ahab, a very famous king, is the eighth king in the, in the lineage of 20 kings. Both kingdoms had 20 kingdoms before their fall. And this is the eighth king out of the eighth of 20. Okay? The majority of the ministry was during his reign, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. That goes from 1 Kings 17 to the chapters 22. 
almost his entire ministry is going to be there. <clears throat> That's important for us to see. And we know from 1 Kings 16, 29, that Ahab was the son of King Omri. Uh, Omri. He reigned over Israel out of, Sam out of Samaria for 22 years. Now, God describes King Ahab's and why God sent Elijah to this king. Now, we're, all, we're in the eighth king out of 22. When the 22nd king comes, Israel is going to fall as a nation. Uh, and the north kingdom is going to fall, 722. They're going to fall. They're not going to listen. Listen, they're not going to listen to this prophet. They're going to fall. But here's how God describes King Ahab and why he sent the prophet to him and to the nation. Ahab, the son of Amri, did evil in the sight of the Lord. Watch this now. You ought to circle this. More than all. Now, who's keeping up with this? <laughs> We're in the eighth king. Who's keeping up with all the kings? God. This is the priest nation of Israel. Even though they've split into north and south, God's concerned about him because he's concerned about 12 tribes. Why? Because of the Messiah. Because this is the, they are the priest nation of Israel, whether they divide themselves or don't divide themselves. They're the priest nation of Israel. He holds them, holds them accountable for the rules and regulations of the priest nation of Israel. They're the custodians, the divine agency and custodians of the word of God, evangelism, whether they're split or not split. He says that this king has created more evil in the priest nation more than all the kings put together. Now, there have been seven kings ahead of him, and they were all evil. And Ahab, if you added them all up and totaled the evil, this guy is more evil than all of them. I mean, who's keeping account? the one who is the head of the priest nation, which is God, not Ahab. Just like who's head of the church? Who's keeping up count? Who's keeping up with the, the, the church? Who's the head? Jesus Christ keeping up with it. He keeps up with it. We don't. How do we know what's going on in all the churches of the world? I'll tell you who does. The head of it. The Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church and savior of the body, is the one that knows about all of it. He knows what's going on. He knows what's going on. And, uh, and, and there's reckoning for it. Reckoning. Listen to what, that, that's in the 16th chapter, verse 30. And then in 1633, he says, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord of Israel more than, see, more than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Now, he's tabulating again. More than all of them. He put the sum total together, and they all did evil. But this guy was the evilest of evil. And so God sends a tough guy, mountain ranger. He sends a tough guy, a tough guy and to handle Ahab, a mountain man, a Jeremiah Johnson guy. Just a tough old bird who loves the Lord, who wants to honor him with his life because of his word in his soul. And he sends him. He's not Mr. Slick. He's not Mr. Slick. If you, if, if you were going to interview him, you wouldn't get much other than the gospel. All he would tell you is that, listen, you better, you, that umbrella you're carrying around, you can get rid of that and sell that. You're not going to need it for three and a half years. I got a drought coming. He said, things are going to really be tough. You're going to eat dirt and be glad for it. It'll be a whole meal of dirt. You'll be thankful that you got something to eat. I guess he'd be Mr. Popular, wouldn't he? But everybody would rush out to write books on him. Listen, anybody write, only buddy who was willing to write a, anything about him was God Almighty. <laughs> we can see by the introduction of Ahab 
that Elijah certainly has his work cut out for him because this nation that he's been sent is full of evil, more evil than ever before. That's hard to believe. And God is sent to reckon. It's time to reckon with it. Today we're going to look at five ideas on this in this first hour. Elijah's prophetic oath is really important to establish his ministry. He, saw, he shows up under point one. He shows up suddenly. He appears on the national stage out of nowhere, out of the, out of the mountain regions of Gilead, crosses over the Jordan as a mountain man, rugged, tough guy with a message to the king. We know nothing about his life other than what we learn in chapter 17. I'll tell you what's important about his life, and it's worth studying, and we're going to study it over the next few Sundays. Here's what's important about his life. Elijah, Elijah was important to show a nation the importance of a spiritual pivot, a remnant. When you study the life of Elijah, you discover something. You discover that Ahab and Jezebel had put the, the, the remnant of God, the believers of God, had put him underground. They persecuted him so terribly that to survive, they went underground. Now, above the ground wasn't good either because it was as hard as a rock. <laughs> Everybody else was underground. All the believers at a point, by the time Elijah shows up, the majority of believers are underground. There's a famous passage in the life of Elijah where he, 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 he complains to God that he is the only believer in the nation. And God tells him, you're wrong. I have 7,000 just like you. They're underground. I have 7,000 just like you, Elijah. What he did is he used Elijah to be the voice of God. Now listen to me. The voice of God and the face of the pivot. He was the one guy that was above ground. God never would let him go underground. Every once in a while, he'd send him away and give him a little R&R &R because of the pressure. And one of the great stories of the life of Elijah is the importance of the word of God in the soul of a believer. And sometimes you have to go underground with it just to survive another day and another opportunity. But Elijah, God wouldn't permit him. He made him become the voice of God and the face of the pivot in a time of great evil in the nation. Great evil. And and you'll see the worst of evil in Ahab and Jezebel. We'll certainly study it. Elijah is well known in the New Testament. He's mentioned 20 times in the New Testament. Seven times in Matthew, six times in Mark, four times in Luke, one time in John, one time in Romans, one time in James. I talked about him the other day when I talked about prayer. I used James. And James used Elijah as an example. And he talks about the three and a half years. He prayed three and a half years of drought. Then he prayed again and had rain come. It's an amazing story, and we'll, we'll certainly talk about it. Listen to this amazing story. The amazing story is that when Elijah prayed, he tells the king, there no, no, no dew and no rain. Now, I'm a farm kid. The dew and the rain are important for harvest. At night, the dew can be the most wonderful thing in the, in the state of Michigan, as well as the rain. We depend on both of them. 
lot of mornings you'd go out and the dew would be so thick, you're, you'd come back and it'd be summertime and you'd come back and your feet would be all wet. Your boots would be wet. He said, there'll be no dew and there'll be no rain until I say the word. I'm going to pray and a drought's going to come upon you. It's going to shut down your entire economy for three and a half years. And it started immediately. You know, isn't it amazing that they shut our economy down immediately? It didn't take a year to shut our economy down. A week. Elijah's going to pray a prayer. And the earth is going to become as hard as rock. Not over a process. Boom! A hard as rock for three and a half years. And it's agricultural. It's not industrial. It's agricultural. And listen to me. Now listen to me. I'm going to show you the power of prayer. He's going to pray a second time. Now you would think after three and a half years, it's going to take a, a lot of rain and a long time to get it back to harvest time, isn't it? Wrong. He's going to pray the prayer, and the earth is going to be restored that when rain comes, you can start to harvest immediately. Isn't that interesting? Let me tell you, it's not interesting if you know the power of prayer. Because the, the, the whole power of prayer is in the person of God who says, I will do what I promised in Romans 4.21. Do you know that kind of prayer life? You should. You go to a church that teaches it. Pray according to the will. He hears you. If he hears you, he answers it. You've got to know the Word of God to have a powerful prayer life. You've got to pray in the power of the Spirit and the power of the Word. And God does the rest. God does the rest. It's not Elijah that creates it. Elijah prays the prayer that God told him to pray, but tell him what you're going to pray before you pray. Tell him what you're going to pray. Pray the prayer so they know who's behind it. Now, they all blame the voice of God in the face of the pivot. They all have blamed Elijah. But God did it. God is the one who answers prayer. Elijah don't answer him. And so we find a very interesting thing. In the name of Elijah, I want to show you something that's really interesting. The name Elijah. I wrote it here on the bottom of your front page of your paper. In the Old Covenant, the word Elijah, in the Hebrew, E-L-I, that's God. J-A-H, that's Jehovah or Lord. Here's what his name says in the Old Testament. My God is my Lord. I'm going to show you something, though. Here's what's wonderful. In the New Testament, it changes. In the New Testament, because of his identity, because of Elijah's identity, with the person of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. That's why he's found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Romans, yada, yada. His name changes to my Lord is my God. That change is enormous. Let me show it to you. Let's go to John. Let's drop, drop over to the book of John, the 14th chapter. 14th chapter, verse 9. I want to show you something. His association with Jesus Christ in the New Testament. John, John 14, 9. Now, he, he addresses this to Philip. You'll see in a moment. See, Philip said to him in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, and it will be enough for us. <laughs> it, it wasn't, by the way. He had shown him plenty, and it wasn't enough. Listen to what he said in verse 9. Jesus said to him, Philip, Have I been with you so have I been so long with you? And yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me 
has seen the Father. How do you say, show us the Father? Listen to me. My Lord is my God. Let me show you the again. Go with me to John 20. John 20. Yeah, I missed it. John 20. You remember the little passage about doubting Thomas? You know, d doubting Thomas, you know, they go back and they say, oh, we've seen the Lord and, and all that. And he goes like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I don't, if I don't see the nail scars and the, and the thrust of the, where the sword went, I won't believe, right? And Jesus shows up. After eight days again, the disciples were inside. Thomas with them, verse 26. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, stood in their midst and said, peace be with you because they were frightened. Then he said to Thomas, reach here your fingers and see my hands and, and reach here your hand and put it into my side and be not unbelieving but believing. Watch Thomas's answer. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. For us in the New Testament, that's what Elijah means to us. Because he believed that. He believed that the Lord Christ was his God. He believed that. Galatians 3.8, how did Elijah get saved? Same way Abraham got saved. The prophetic gospel of Christ, that he would come, he would die on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead. If you believe it, you get saved. Did you write down Galatians 3.8? How did people get saved in the Old Testament? Yeah, you should have. Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you've believed. Blessed are guys like us in this church. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. Believe what the Word says. Believe what God says about it. It should be sufficient for us. Colossians 1.15. He, Christ, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verse 4. The light of the gospel is the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The name Elijah. The name Elijah. How interesting a prophet this guy is. Point two, Elijah introduced himself to King Ahab with the prophetic oath of authority representing divine authority over the priest nation. He comes to, it, it, listen, it, listen, <laughs> here's what you don't understand. This old mountain guy, he shows up. God is the head of the priest nation. Under the authority of God is the king. Equal with the king is the national prophet. Equal with the king. Here is God. The absolute authority over the priest nation of Israel. Underneath him, of authority, is the king, in this case, Ahab. And equal, when he sends a national prophet, he is in equal footing, and when he speaks to the king, he speaks authority over the king. Do you understand that? Elijah introduced himself with his prophetic oath, declares that, and reminds the king of that that he has divine authority over the priest nation of Israel, even equal and authority over when he speaks for God to the king about his role, has authority over him. And 
the great prophets to the king of Israel all knew that and they all got in trouble for it by evil kings. The kings who, who understood it and believed him, they became the good kings. They're recorded in the word of God as the good kings, not the evil ones. So there's two things when you look at 1 Kings 17, 1. There's the first part, which is the oath, as the Lord Yahweh, as the Lord Yahweh, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, serve as representative authority. Surely there should be a comma after that because it means, surely means face to face. I bring authority. Listen what Elijah says to him. This is the oath. I stood in the presence of God Almighty and was given a message. I bring that message word for word to you by his authority. That's the word surely. <laughs> what I'm about to tell you is not by my authority, but by the authority of the one whom I serve as, king, as a prophet to the nation. And surely this will happen. Because God, what he promises, whether, whether you consider it good or bad, you should consider it all good, shouldn't you? Romans 8, 28. Will come to pass. Romans 4, 21. It will come to pass. And that's what he's telling the king. Listen, I don't bring this as a message from my soul to yours. I bring this from a message from the soul of God to the soul of the king of the north kingdom. A prophet with an important prophetic message to the king of the north kingdom of Israel. Elijah stands before the king representing the Lord, the God of Israel, with a warning to the king of Israel against the worship of Baal. It was demonic, evil idolatry. The worship of Baal, the failing cult was demonic idolatry. You can read about that, demonic idolatry, in 1 Corinthians 10. It's talked about there. Why is this so important to God? Listen to me. Write this down. It's not in your notes. Exodus 20, 1 through 6. You know what that is? Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments had two parts. It had four commands from God that represented him, and then six on the man side. There's a God side and a man side. Thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not. But on the other side, it, he makes it very clear. Serve no other God but Jehovah and him alone. Serve no other God. Elijah's name means that. Serve no other God. You shall serve no other gods before me. This is the message that Elijah has brought in a reminder to King Ahab. Point three. Elijah brought a warning of divine discipline, of the five cycles of divine discipline against the North, North Kingdom, which you can read about in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. The warning to Ahab was, if you choose to worship and serve Baal, rather than the Lord, the God of Israel, Israel will receive the second cycle immediately of divine discipline upon the economy. If you, if you continue to serve Baal, your, your authority, shut it down. If you shut down the demonic system of idolatry, of, of worship of Baal, it was a state religion, by the way. It, it was supported by the state, run and funded, Baal worship. 
God says, shut it down. Shut it down, or I'm going to shut down your economy. That's the second cycle of five. Shut it down. Shut this down. Shut the evil system down, or I'm going to shut the whole nation down. I'm going to, I'm going to lock it up. Well, we know what he, his choice was, don't we? Here's what I want you to do on your free time this week. You got free time? Or are you back to work? <laughs> you back to work? Well, on one of your breaks, read Leviticus 26, 16 through 20, because in the five cycles of discipline, God offers a promise. You can stop this thing anytime you want to, and he tells them how. Leviticus 26, 16 through 20. Shut this down. If you don't, I'm going to shut you down. At any point, you can come back under this protocol. And he gives it to him. He gives him a promise in the midst of discipline. It's well worth your read under point three. Unfortunately, for the rest of the people of the North Kingdom, Ahab chose Baal and divine discipline. What, how arrogant can you be to say to God, bring it on? Ah, what a dangerous idea that is. Well, just bring it on. So he did. He did. And it started immediately. It wasn't slow, gradual in it. Boom! He shut the whole thing down right then. Boom! You know what's interesting? What's interesting to me as a student of the Word of God, God did that with 186 nations. Boom! And what America ought to realize, he released it out of an evil society. You do know that communism is evil, don't you? My goodness, people. You better be teaching your young people for they're as dumb as a brick. They may be smart, but they're dumb as a brick when they think that communism would be a good system to be under. Shut down 186. Boom. And what is it? Listen, it's an awakening to God. There is no doubt when he shuts down 186 overnight, boom, like that. And they're all in the same boat, boom, like that. This is a chance for 186 nations to come to God consciousness and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the church has got to be ready to do it. This is a time of awakening. We've had many awakenings in Christianity. If you study the history of Christianity from the first century to now, there have been a lot of awakenings, enlightenments. You've got to have eyes to see it. This is a chance to look to God and a chance to identify. Listen, the church knows no man can come to the Father. God has awakening. Come to me. Come to the Father. Give up all this foolishness and come to God. They don't know how to do it. The church of Jesus Christ is responsible to tell them that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father except through Jesus. That he died for your sins. He was buried. He's raised from the dead to the third day. And when you believe it, you come into the favor of God. And without it, you're not in the favor of God. I don't care if you're in America or wherever you are. This is a time he shut us down as an awakening. And we've got to take advantage of this. We've got to be bold. The world doesn't know. They know they've been shut down. They know they've been shut down by a power above their own government. 
The only power above the nation, the nation and the government is God Almighty. Genesis 10. Genesis 10 and 11. My goodness. This is a time of great awakening. This is not a time of discipline. This is a time of great awakening. A great awakening. Al said it really well. He gave us three, three years of plenty to get through three months of bad. But listen, why is God doing it? It's to bring an awakening, a spiritual awakening in the world. And somebody, somebody has got to go tell them. Now, thank God for the Internet. We're all over this stuff. We're, we're telling them. I'm telling them today if they've got ears to hear. Listen, the first move that you need to make is not social distancing. What you've got to do is declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, man, listen, this is an awakening of God. Who's over nations? Who has authority over nations? No government shut this stuff down, truly. Nobody would have shut their own nation down like this. God did it. Everybody knows. It. That's not, is there anybody that, maybe China, doesn't know that God shut, did this? I mean, you've got to have the blindness of, Ab of, of, uh, of Arab. Ahab, not Arab. I, mean, I got the people nervous in Arab. You're all right. And listen, if you love God, you're all right. Ahab chose Baal and divine discipline. He, he, he was arrogant. Evil is always arrogant. Bring it on. Bring it on. Listen, the last thing you want to tell God is to bring it on. The last thing you want to tell him is to bring it on. It started immediately and would continue until the fall of the North Kingdom in 722 B.C. This is 874. Ahab is about 874. And, and God is not going to squeeze him down until 722 because of evil. You know what that tells you? It tells you 2 Peter 3, 9. God is patient and long-suffering that none should perish. It be, listen, I know the unbeliever will be awakened. I know there are 86 nations right now that, are going, that have, has a spiritual awakening. America is one of them. We're one of them. This is a spiritual way. This is a wonderful time for us. The church has got to be bold. The church has got to take the message of the gospel. We've got to take it not only into America. Listen, America is divided right down the middle, evil on one side and good on the other. If, America, if you don't see the tree of knowledge in America, you've been blind. Look, at, you can even look at the map on red and blue right now. And you can see it. In those blue states, we need to go evangelize them. They're in deep trouble. One of them is my state, Michigan. They got my people up north. They got my people. They got my people. So uh, they're farmers. You can't tell them they can't go outside. You, they're farmers. You can't tell them they can't milk the cows. They're farmers. You can't tell them they can't have a garden. They think you're nuts. The southern half of that state needs to be evangelized. I knew it when I went to Michigan. I went to the upper part of Michigan. I took the easy road. When I went to Ypsilanti, they put me in jail. I tried to evangelize Ypsilanti, Ann Arbor. They put me in jail. Said I was soliciting. I was preaching the gospel in the public square. And they call it soliciting. And that's in the... When was that, Mike? 70? 
Yeah, 71, two, or something like that. Mike was with us. He didn't go to jail with us, but he was with us. Well, I'm going to do one more point, and I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to tell you what it is. You know, people, I, I, I get all kinds of calls. What do you think this is, Ron? Is this discipline? Is this? I can tell you what it is. It's as clear as a bell in my soul. Because he's, the way he did it, 186 countries. I mean, when I was Billy Graham, when I was Billy Graham, we had a large map of the world. They had dots, they had little stickers all over them. Of course, I'm a curious person. I ask a thousand questions. Well, what is all this and what's that? Yeah, yeah. Well, these are the places we've been and this is the places we're going. Some of them were in America and some were in Europe, South America. And I looked at, I was especially interested in the, in the Russia, China, India, Pakistan, those places, all had stickers on where we were going. Where we were going. And they had some that were, had a funny red look to it. I said, well, what are those funny looking red things? That, that some of these stickers got a funny looking red to it. He said, yeah, those are the hot spots. We believe right now those are the places that where there is positive volition of evangelism. And so those are our hot spots. All over the world, there were hot spots. All over the world. I said, how do you, how do you know that? He said, because the amount of people that are appealing to us to come. The call of Macedonia. They called it the call of Macedonia, the hot spots. We need to get us a map and put it up there and look at this 186. We need to start praying that God would raise up people. Give us people that can go and work with nationalists that are really interested in a in this awakening. This is a, an awakening. If the church follows this awakening towards God, great evangelism will come. If the church sets on their haunches like we are typically prone to do, we'll lose this opportunity. This is one of the great opportunities that you have in spiritual awakening. And this is one that's worldwide. That's my opinion. Under King Ahab's reign, evil became the new norm for the life in Israel. First, First uh, Kings 16.31, it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for Ahab to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebar, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ithbel. Look at that name. Got Baal in it. The king of Sidonian and went to serve Baal and worshipped him. In your face, prophet, in your face. You go back and tell your God, I'm the king of Israel. I'm the king. I'll do it my way. And so, immediately, the ground become rock hard. Immediately, not over a long period of time. Even Elijah, at this moment in his life, was not aware that the number of the pivot of believers underground was at 7,000, waiting for an awakening to march forward for God. Paul talks about it in Romans 11. Elijah had become the public voice of God in the face of the pivot. He was a true ambassador like you and I. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Ed's going to come back and close us with a song. Are you, Ed? Yeah, boy. Well, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. I thank you, Father, for these. These are the pivot. 
been underground for a while, now we're out. What we're going to do with this time, this spiritual awakening that's in America and across the world, I hope it's a new normal for us. We don't go back to the old. A new normal. Everybody in our time is talking about a new normal out of fear. I'm talking about a new normal out of faith. May we be bold with the word of God and bold with the gospel to take it across the world into these nations, these 160, 186. May the church of Jesus Christ in America rise up for this occasion. May we, Father, be bold in it. May we be bold in this opportunity at a spiritual awakening. Oh, God, we're so excited about it. A spiritual awakening. I thank you for the pivot that has had the courage to come out and be with us today. May this, Father, be the beginning of a new normal in the church that becomes evangelistic. A church that becomes evangelistic not only in our community, not only in our nation, but across the world. For we've made this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.